The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. We'll start with a little history. I don't know. Uh, I've also got some deep dive slides that I'm happy to run into as well. Um, historically, I have been a Gluster user, although I am a comparatively lightweight user uh, because now I no longer manage hundreds of machines. I manage tens of machines at best, and it's not my full-time job. So um, uh, keep that in mind when you hear something from me. Um, So for those of you coming in, my name is John Mark Walker. I work for Red Hat, and please find me offensive and complain. Um, so the big idea behind Gluster is effectively having commodity scale out storage. So uh, if, if you've been around enterprise storage, you know that effectively it's um, SANS or uh, you'll have a filer, uh, a NAS filer that will provide you massive amounts of storage. And it's also very painful to increase that storage as you grow. Uh, typically, it's going to get more and more expensive to maintain support. You're going to have to do forklift upgrades uh, when you reach certain capacity levels, both from an I.O. perspective as well as a complete capacity perspective. And so, uh, this was originally born out of a uh, project that someone had for, um, for what we would probably call grid computing. Um, a research institution in South America uh, needed to be able to, to do some things and the folks behind Gluster uh, did not want to do storage because storage is painful and, and everybody hates doing it. Um, and people have these expectations around uh, not losing files and not losing data um, that are far more exacting than typical uh, software writing will allow. Um, so they didn't want to do that. They were looking at some of the, uh, the existing implementations, things like Lustre and GFS, and all of them had uh, a number of limitations and also just didn't scale. Um, there's a lot of marketing fluff in here, and I will be happy to tell you when it's marketing fluff, um, and uh, we'll skip those slides really quickly. Uh, so the idea behind scale out or distributed uh, storage is that effectively you can add additional bricks to your storage building at any time. So you may start off with 15 servers that are providing storage, and you can add a machine to it, and you're adding incrementally. And that is giving you both additional I.O. as well as additional capacity. And this allows you to scale up in a sustainable way without having to do forklift upgrades like you would have to do with uh, enterprise uh, storage options. This has been driven and probably accelerated a lot because of this idea of uh, cloud computing and the entire commoditization of, of everything that's happened. So when you know, it costs you eight cents an hour to run a, uh, a virtual machine, paying $20,000 uh, just for a uh, memory upgrade on your, on a SAN filer uh, is, sounds crazy in, uh, in that same context. So this is effectively providing a commodity. You can use x86 boxes or ARM boxes for that matter to provide, uh, uh, to provide their disks as available to, uh, for this distributed storage. So this is marketing fluff. They want to show you how, uh, how they used to be. This is more marketing fluff, but shows you a little bit about uh, some of the places that have deployed it. It's marginally interesting, but you know, it doesn't really add value. Um, this, is, uh, this is some of the larger users of Gluster that are using this in production right now. Um, the big group is Pandora. So if you use Pandora to listen to music, uh, all of that music is stored on Gluster, and they are one of the larger implementations of, of Gluster out there. 
Uh, we'll talk about them a little more in depth simply because they provide uh, a great example of the ideal workload for, uh, uh, for Gluster. Um, interestingly enough, Patio is a, uh, is a company that was just acquired by the company I work for, um, and I didn't know that they were a Gluster user until recently. So the, the real problem is, is that you know, we have typically bought, um, we typically bought storage and we've expected it to last us three or so years, um, maybe five years if we're, if we're buying really high-end stuff that's expandable. Um, that's not keeping up with the rate of, of data growth. Um, the annual rate of data growth is 74%, uh, according to, I think this is Gartner that said this. Um, and that is, that is very hard to predict and very hard to keep up with when you're making huge capital investments five years in advance. So it, when you consider that we are expanding the rate, the, the rate of growth as well, um, it, uh, it's very hard to do things uh, when, when most of those are very painful upgrades or plateau upgrades. Uh, you, can, you can continue expanding with disk shelves until you reach a certain point. Um, and by the way, this is a complete marketing fluff slide. Um, so what do you want to use Gluster for? Because Gluster is not a solution to every storage problem. Um, Gluster will allow you to mainly store unstructured data. So think about uh, documents, images. In the case of Pandora, they use it for audio files. Um, that is an ideal use case. It's, it's uh, data that's uh, reasonably large, but not, uh, uh, but not terribly structured. It's not like a, uh, a database file. Um, I hear that people are using Gluster for database. Really a bad use case for that, unless you're doing, uh, using something like HDFS and, and uh, doing Hadoop. Um, so Gluster just recently had its 3.3 release in which they uh, brought out a number of things around big data. So they brought out um, uh, HDFS compatibility. So if you are into big data and you're, you want to use a Hadoop-like uh, file system, uh, you can use Gluster uh, to do that. You can also do object storage. So how many of you are familiar with S3 from Amazon? Awesome, lots of people. So, Amazon allows you to essentially instantiate uh, the existence of an object, which is a file uh, most of the time. And, uh, and you can't do things like modify the file without writing the entire file back out. So if you're doing something that changes frequently, it's very inefficient. What it does allow you to do, though, is it allows very simple access to those, uh, to those objects, uh, very simple to push the objects up to write them. And uh, so uh, Gluster will provide you the ability to have that object store and to use, uh, uh, it actually uses the OpenStack Swift API uh, to, uh, to expose those objects uh, and expose that object store. And the nice thing about Gluster is that, uh, you know, while you might uh, access your video files uh, mounting the file system as you would a traditional file system, you, uh, you would not, uh, you would also have access to the same objects, same files through an object store. So they call that unified file access. And um, so essentially the same program, the same repository of information, you can access that as an object store, as a file. You can do it with HDFS, et cetera. Have I confused anyone so far? This is a pretty marketing heavy slide. Things should be simple. Things really rarely are. Um, so Gluster's unified. We talked about unified a bit. It's distributed, so effectively it uh, distributes uh, the bits that are your files um, across a number of nodes, uh, and it will continue splitting those up and figuring out where those are to reassemble them. 
Um, and, uh, and of course, that means that you can also specify some redundancy in there as well. Um, so, so there's some controversy around how Gluster does things. The, uh, the Gluster folks were originally, uh, and if you look at the, one of the names on the title slide, AB, uh, was a GNU herd developer. Uh, and GNU herd has a microkernel architecture where very, very little is actually in the kernel and everything else is in user space. Um, there is a significant chunk of folks who, who think that um, user space file systems um, cannot be performant. And uh, um, even Linus says that uh, user space file systems are, real, are realistic for anything but toys. Those people are just misguided. So, um, and that's, that's honestly true, right? So uh, the vast majority of, of user space file systems that you would mount with things like Fuse, you cannot get decent performance on. Um, some of the, the reasons that Gluster still did this and still are able to maintain high performance is that they had a deep understanding of how to do things uh, from this microkernel architecture perspective, and that allowed them to um, that allowed them to focus on performance and tune it very heavily. Uh, and you know, uh, Gluster will expose NFS, so it has a effectively its own NFS implementation that you can mount. Uh, that is still slower than their Fuse uh, their Fuse uh, client. So if you mount it via Fuse, you actually get better performance. So you can see uh, specifying some of these, some of the Gluster volumes um, and turning on uh, different, uh, different features, including performance uh, options, et cetera. Um, so this is a quick uh, show of how at least how originally this was done, it's pretty rudimentary. So from an evolution, uh, you used to have to do handcrafted uh, definition files for your volumes. Um, it was really simple. Uh, the store, the performance was faster than tape and people thought that was good and I suppose it is. Um, so, you know, the, uh, they built this originally for a giant compute cluster in South America who need to process large amounts of data. Um, uh, what we would typically consider HDFS for these days, uh, except Hadoop didn't exist at the time. Um, so uh, they ended up seeing that even that use case was, was somewhat limited and people were using Gluster for unstructured data. And I think that still remains the the um, uh, still remains the uh, the prime use case. So, Gluster 3.0 and 3.1 came about in 2010. Uh, they um, they essentially added the ability to make it elastic, so you can remove and add uh, volumes uh, with Gluster. Uh, they provided their own NFS implementation. Uh, this is really when people started taking notice of Gluster. Um, uh, and you can see some of these things. So if you're adding a brick, you're essentially adding a host that's going to be on a, uh, on a volume. Uh, you can have it rebalance an entire volume. So your volume would be spread across n number of nodes. You can have it rebalance. And of course, you can do that all. Um, you can script all of that so that it's not... Uh, it's not something you have to do manually. Um, just going back to this real quickly, you can create volumes and you can see how many stripes that volume is going to be on, how many replicas there needs to be of each piece of data. Uh, so that gives you some, uh, some options there and you can of course, uh, um, you can of course uh, set uh, stripes and replicas up to whatever you feel comfortable trusting your data to. So in 3.2, we, Gluster introduced geo-replication. It's async. Um, that's getting dramatically better with 3.3, but 3.2 geo-replication did come in. Um, 
but that meant that if you changed five terabytes in one day, then you have a huge five terabyte change as opposed to that was you know, 10 megabytes at a time. So you were effectively saying, point in time, go ahead and replicate this elsewhere. Uh, and you could do that. And they did that simply because um, replicating in real time across a WAN just doesn't, does not, uh, does not work readily. Um, that's getting somewhat better. It's getting a lot more granular in 3.3. Um, so here's what we used to see, right? We used to see fiber channel, fiber channel over ethernet started coming in uh, recently. iSCSI predates fiber channel over ethernet a bit. Um, but S3 came along, completely changed that object storage, push everything up and down via uh, HTTP. And uh, it's, uh, it's a lot simpler. You don't have to have complex, um, you don't have to have complex uh, modules. You can have anything access your objects. Um, we also used to have appliance-based stuff. Uh, so I can't tell you how many proprietary um, SAN storage uh, pieces that I've actually had that were based on things like VxWorks or, or um, some proprietary Unix and of course completely locked down so you couldn't do anything that they didn't want you to do and that was all tied into licensing. Um, and so application and, and Gluster is certainly not the, only, um, not the only application in this space. There's a number of others uh, each having their own little niche. Um, but, uh, you know, things are, things are dr dramatically, especially if you look at some of the people who are doing distributed computing architectures already, um, there are very few of them who are calling up EMC or NetApp and saying, hey, I've got this uh, 10,000 node um, distributed architecture. I'm going to need some storage for that. First of all, the 10,000 client licenses would price them out of business, I think, but um, uh, so things are certainly moving, I think, in a distributed storage function. This is a marketing fluff slide. Um, it doesn't tell you anything important. And so when we talk about this scale out or distributed um, infrastructure, uh, some of the early people who were doing this right were Google and Facebook. Google certainly before Facebook. But uh, Google has this idea, and not just with storage, but with, uh, you know, essentially everything they do, that they don't care about the individual nodes, uh, they are building in redundancy, and the same should be true of storage. And so this is, this distributed storage is just a natural evolution of the rest of this scale out or distributed architecture. And that is that particular slide. Let me, uh, anybody want to ask questions while I switch? Slide decks, go ahead. Yes. Yeah. No. No. There's typically not a backend SAN. Uh, it there's typically only um, local disk on each node, and uh, and it is managing the local storage, and so it's it's very commodity. You're using. Uh, SAS or SATA disks typically, and um, and the nodes are replicating the data among all of those. Um, there are there are production. The question was, what is the typical size? And there are uh, so my my instances of Gluster are in the couple terabyte range, and I would consider myself very, very small. Um, there are a number of Gluster um, implementation that are in the tens of petabytes. So, um, oh no, not on each node. T typically each node is going to be, um, uh, the low end is probably hundreds of gigabytes and the high end is, is probably tens of terabytes. Yes, sir. Uh, 
Um, so, so you're talking like the old open AFS model where everybody tossed their, yeah, you can, assuming that you haven't given your users too much power, you can probably do that with no problem. The, the things that would worry me are users are prone to turn their machines off and you wouldn't want to have enough replication to, to do that well. And um, Gluster is also assuming a, uh, for, for a given volume that it's all going to be on the same network. So that's an architectural issue potentially because you might not have everybody on the same VLAN. Um, So OpenAFS uh, architecturally is a little different. Um, first of all, it's uh, the, uh, the clients are kernel based, right? Um, and OpenAFS is not in the kernel and so it's, it's something that you typically compile uh, yourself, which is painful. Um, Gluster makes that a little easier. Well, you know, it's not painful if you're doing it for a thousand machines. It's very painful if you've got to have support on those machines because then you just modified your kernel and you call up your friendly Red Hat or SUSE support rep and he goes, oh, you have a tainted kernel or oh, you have a uh, kernel that is not the kernel we shipped you. Please repeat this problem when you're using the right kernel. Um, so it's not technically difficult, it's, it's challenging for places that care about having support. Um, and it's also burdensome because every, uh, every kernel update means you have to go and recompile your kernel. Um, and it also means that you potentially need to keep those kernel, um, those kernel updates in sync, and especially across a volume. And it's a lot easier to have a client package that is completely standalone and effectively a leaf package. Um, it's, it's a lot easier to keep that all on the same version across your enterprise, then, you know, I've got Rails 6.2 here and Rails 6.3 is coming out and I want to upgrade to Rails 6.3 on these machines. Oh no, different kernel. Um, got to make sure that it all works. Uh, so I think, it's, I think it's actually a little easier. Um, so there's also some, uh, Gluster doesn't have this, uh, a lot of distributed file systems say, yes, we're going to distribute out the, uh, the data, but we're not going to, we have essentially these nodes that track metadata like file names and, and attributes of the file. And so those become the choke points or sometimes a single point of failures for those distributed file systems. There are still some that do that, um, not, not OpenAFS in particular, but um, there is a, a very large distributed file system project that still gets a ton of press that if the metadata server goes down, it, uh, you essentially lose access and it's, a, it's not designed to be replicated. Um, there's, also some, uh, uh, there's also some issues around when you do have metadata servers, even if they are replicable, um, to track the number of objects as the number of objects increases. If that actually goes to disk, you start losing tons of performance uh, because you then are querying where is the file and we have to go to disk to find out where the file is and oh yeah, it's not here, it's over there. And so your latency starts increasing tremendously. With Gluster, the architecture is that there is no master. Uh, we'll talk about quorum in a bit, but, uh, but essentially you can, um, it doesn't matter if you have the, uh, um, uh, you know, a bazillion files, you don't have to have those all on a single metadata server. So kind of removing at least one of those choke points or adding some additional latency. Yes, sir. I, 
I think it could. I, I think it depends upon what workload you're wanting to put on that. Um, there are a lot of workloads that I think Gluster is poorly suited for. Um, until 3.3, I would have said putting VM images on Gluster was a bad idea, but I think that they have dramatically improved some of the granularity behind that so that that performance is increasing. I would not, for instance, put large databases on Gluster. It, it, people have done it. It will not perform as you expect it to, and it, that is not the solution that you're looking for. Um, if, on the other hand, you have, you know, 500,000 video files, maybe that works for you. Uh, if, uh, if you're starting to do, uh, if you need a Hadoop-like file system, um, perhaps Gluster gives you some options that straight HDFS does not. So um, I think it depends upon workload. I think that uh, most people don't realize the amount of actual local direct attached storage they have that they could start leveraging for this. Um, at the same time, I would not go out and deploy Gluster just because I wanted to do Gluster. I would actually have the problem to solve that Gluster would do, uh, would solve for me in advance. Yes, sir. Um, I would not personally know. Um, I don't know what the official Gluster line on that is because I, I don't know. So, but I that would not be a workload that I personally would put on it. Yes. probably not to the degree that you're expecting it. Um, so, yes, but no. Any other questions or we'll, we will keep marching on. All right, so we will not talk about this. Um, so there've been some replication improvements, uh, essentially, and they talk about granular locking, but the entire process of replication has been made more granular in 3.3. Uh, and uh, so that, uh, that helps certainly with uh, uh, geo-replication, uh, but also the, the local replication has been enhanced significantly. Um, HDFS compatibility is something else that's new to 3.3. Uh, unified file and object storage has been around since 3.2, but nobody talked about it uh, for some reason um, and has really matured in 3.3. Uh, marketing fluff, uh, you've seen that before, we've seen that before. Uh, so things that aren't on here, uh, before Gluster was acquired by Red Hat, some of the interesting things that were done by the community were multi-tenant encrypted um, file system atop Gluster. So Gluster has this concept of translators and uh, a guy named Jeff Darcy wrote a translator, um, and he's an amazing individual for doing this because there was essentially no documentation other than the source code. Um, and he went through and created a translator that said, you know what, this is a massive file store and I don't trust anybody else using it. I need this to be multi-tenant so everything's isolated from everyone else and it needs to have an option for encrypting it all so that even if someone else got a hold of it, it would be useless. So he came up with HECA FS, uh, which is layered atop Gluster, uh, and is certainly worth a, a look. I think it's, the current plan is that it's going to be merged into, uh, into Gluster. Uh, Jeff was a, uh, was a storage guy at Red Hat, and before Gluster was acquired, he was, uh, he was one of the big external community contributors and, uh, and did some really awesome things with HECA FS. Uh, and that's H-E-K-F-S, and it's worth uh, taking a look at if you've got a multi-tenant environment or you need heavy um, isolated encryption on a uh, distributed file system. Um, anything else there that's, uh, so one of the community-led features was of course geo-replication, uh, and that's really matured a lot in 2012. 
So in 2011, it was effectively a replicated distributed file system, and it was nothing more than scale out NAS, um, which was okay place to start. Um, but you can start seeing some of the, the gaps. Uh, object storage became something people wanted, and not just wanted, but were consuming very heavily. If you look at the growth in storage just of S3, um, it's staggering, and um, I honestly think that it scares the uh, traditional storage vendors quite a bit, uh, enough that we've seen uh, some proprietary companies like Coringo get into the object storage space, and that's effectively the only thing they sell is object storage appliances. <laughs> big data. Um, I don't know that big data started in 2011, but big data really took off in 2010, 2011. Um, Gluster didn't have any Hadoop or uh, MapReduce capabilities. Um, they certainly couldn't do any kind of structured database, not well anyway. Um, so here are some of the problems people had when they were putting VM images up. Uh, it's really difficult to self-heal Gluster, or it was uh, back in 2011, rebalancing it so you know not everything was coming from a single node, uh, especially if you were adding nodes for additional capacity. Um, and of course, it didn't do small files. Uh, very well, and I, and I will argue that it still does not do small files very well. Um, so as they were developing uh, uh, Gluster, essentially they started trying to fill these gaps. Uh, they focused very heavily on replication and especially making all of that far more granular. So instead of updating an entire file, uh, replicating an entire file, let's just update the, the, uh, the blocks that were updated. Um, Self-healing used to be just healing. Uh, in other words, you had to go and tell it to heal itself. Uh, that's no longer uh, a problem. Uh, one of the problems that you typically had, though, was um, if, there, uh, if you encountered a problem and you ran into a split brain issue, so you have these distributed systems and they become disconnected and you have half on one side and half on the other, um, and you've got multiple people still accessing both sides, which one's the latest revision? And how do you know? Because they're going to be updating each other. Uh, they're going to say, oh, that's a new version three. And the other side says, oh, this is the new version three. Which one's the real version three and which one's version four? Um, that was a real problem. So they introduced this concept of quorum, meaning uh, to to consider yourself authoritative, you must have a minimum number of nodes, and that minimum number of nodes is something you can specify. Uh, and they add a synchronous translator API because async was async was probably right from a storage perspective to you know wait until it's written out, but uh, was annoying because a lot of those things weren't just storage and I/O going in and out. So. <coughs> um, this granular locking, um, it's block by block uh, uh, locking now, and uh, if a node goes out, um, effectively it's going to lock its own and it will compare it with what was the live version uh, until it's compared all the blocks, and otherwise those will be locked. And this actually forms some of the basis for some of the better, uh, um, better replication. So. Uh, Self-healing is performed server to server. There's no need for you to get involved. Um, when a node comes online or a node uh, recovers, it's actually going to query its peers to find out the status of things, um, to find out if it's even valid to, uh, to come back in. And it will automatically say, oh, I'm supposed to have, we'll say that these are really blocks. I'm supposed to have blocks one, two, and three. Um, let me get them from a from one of the good replicas that the quorum agrees is good. Um, so we talked about this real briefly, um, uh, split brain, and, and a lot of the quorum enforcement uh, has gone uh, into this to stop this, because this was a big problem that they 
would see, especially as uh, there were larger and larger deployments of Gluster. Uh, it became more and more common for there to be these conflicts in which, uh, which version uh, or iteration was the correct one. And this is marketing fluff that we've already talked about. Uh, and so this is briefly demonstrating the, uh, if you don't have quorum, essentially the Gluster uh, daemon will stop allowing you to have writes to those bricks. And if you do have quorum, you may continue writing. Um, so let's talk about uh, the synchronous translators allow you to do things that aren't necessarily I.O. bound um, or I.O. sensitive, um, but nobody cares about that, uh, or I don't care about that. Uh, and that's because I'm not writing a translator. Unified file and object uh, access. Uh, so you can have the same, the same file, um, which of course is gonna be on a volume which will have directories and we'll have files there and both an object storage client and, or a NFS or Gluster mount can access the same thing and that gives you multiple routes to it so you're really stupid applications that you don't want to have to assume that uh, there's a fuse client on or you don't wanna to have to mount an NFS mount or maybe you can't uh, because it's over the WAN uh, can still get uh, access to a file uh, using object storage. So um, HDFS compatibility uh, essentially gives you the ability to run MapReduce uh, jobs on Gluster uh, and gives you more of that unstructured data uh, capability to Hadoop um, and uh, and then, you know, so your Hadoop server is processing against your, your cluster volumes. Um, I think cluster, cluster's structure is actually a little more redundant than HDFS's. HDFS, I think, I'm not saying that they do this, but I think that the assumptions that they make are that things will work well and um, that if there's a failure, you can start all over again and, and be running the same analysis, um, which, is, which is fine for some implementations. I think Gluster actually provides a little more redundancy uh, in that setup uh, because HDFS, if things start breaking apart, it starts failing very rapidly. And this has a little bit better capability to keep up. All right, so again, if you wish to complain about this presentation, johnmarketredhat.com is where you can email uh, the person to complain at. Um, any questions I can answer about Gluster? Yes. So it, it has no inherent knowledge of things like dedupe. Um, and it really doesn't have a concept of, it really doesn't have a concept of a, um, that it should, that it should be keeping the same exact files, um, as a single object. It, uh, it is dumb in that particular method and it, it just assumes that you know what you're doing and that you're putting uh, data, the right data and that you're not copying 50 files of itself because it will, of course, distribute and replicate all 50 copies. Yes. So I have heard of people doing um, ZFS and Gluster and, and particularly, but they're running ZFS atop Gluster, so Gluster is, is to take advantage of snapshots um, because, um, uh, but I haven't, I don't know if people are doing the opposite way or if that would work even. Um, uh, certainly you could use ZFS as the, as the back end, but I don't know that it would necessarily help you because it's going to be 
chunks of files that are written to ZFS. So I don't know that there's a benefit there. Um, I don't know that there's a benefit there to, to running ZFS under Gluster. Really? I can't believe Red Hat says that. Um, wow. They used to say XFS. Um, and, and technically, they'll do anything that has extended attributes. Um, I find that very interesting that they would suggest ZFS, especially since they can't then sell that. Um, Right, yeah. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't know that I understand the reason for, for using ZFS. You're getting SAN capabilities on your direct attached storage. Right. The, the concern that I have with ZFS is um, Solaris isn't necessarily dead, but Open Solaris certainly is. And FreeBSD, yeah, but FreeBSD is actually using a comp several versions back of ZFS. They're not using uh, the latest. And uh, okay, I was going to say, I can't, I can't believe that they want to do ZFS. That, that makes no sense on Red Hat's part. Yeah, so, so I actually had this argument with them and I told them uh, um, probably, actually it was at the last self, I had a call with, uh, with AB and John Mark and I said, so, I see the recommended way is Fuse, and I was a Gluster noob at the time. Um, and I said, that makes no sense. That's just horrendous capability. When are you guys gonna get it in the kernel? And AB laughed at me and said, have you actually tried it? And I said, well, you know, I've tried it. And I, I don't know that I've done any performance tests. And uh, Gluster is, is never going to be uh, a, an incredible speed demon. It will be impressive for for the size that you push it to. Um, but, uh, you know, when I actually got around to investigating, the Fuse client gave surprisingly good performance, um, especially for what it is, which is a distributed file system. And it was, it, was beating, uh, it was beating some of the other things that I had been looking at, like Lustre. Um, for, for the given workloads, it was doing a much better job. So. Uh, looking at the Fuse client, um, ignore your prejudices for a bit and try it and see if it will deliver what you want. Uh, I was pleasantly surprised. So, All right, well, I will gladly shut up if no one else has questions. Hey, question. Go for it. Say that one more time. Yeah, so it'll it'll handle sparse files. Um, it's not going to do it any faster because it's looking at the block level rather than considering, oh, this is a bunch of zeros that I can compress. So it will handle them as if it's not a sparse file. Right. All right. Well, I appreciate your attention. I apologize that I'm not John Mark for you. Um, feel free to complain to him there. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. 
Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astra's. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again. This time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astra based systems, including our own SwitchFox-based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox-based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out, and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think, it's, uh, I think it's an assumption, I think. When you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail, and CloudStack is designed to handle number one, that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens. Uh, large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. 
lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint, it's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. Cloudstack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think Cloudstack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack.